computer. And let me know when it's live. Live. Okay. Go ahead and turn the volume down on the playback machine. On the web computer, just turn the source volume down so you don't get any echo on that machine. Yeah. Is it down? Yeah. Okay. Turn the volume down on your computer then? Yeah. So we don't get any beeps. Yeah. All right, folks. Well, we're just going to get started in just a moment. Uh, you're going to be joining me for a live Google Plus Hangout. We're going to be talking about panoramic photography, getting started, both the production, the shooting side, and the post-production side. I'm just going to give folks a couple of minutes to log on in. Okay. Hillary, do we have any viewers logged in live? No. Doesn't say any viewers? Um, says, no, look under the, bro the broadcast computer. There we go. Good. All right. So some folks are logged in live. We are ready to get started. I'd like to welcome you. My name is Rich Harrington. I am the publisher of photofocus.com and I appreciate you guys tuning in today. We're going to be taking a look at getting started with panoramic photography. So we're going to take a wide range of approaches today from the no budget approach of shooting handheld all the way up to using a professional rig. And I'll talk about some of the pros and cons of each. And then we'll be jumping into Lightroom and Photoshop and Perfectly Clear to teach you how to use some of those tools to get great looking panoramic photos. So a wide range of things to cover today. Now, feel free to post questions on the Google Plus page or using the Q&A section. If you are watching this on a desktop computer, you'll see that Q&A. And this will make it easy for you to post questions. Now, since I'm standing in front of the camera and not in front of a computer today, I'm not actually able to see those questions while we're going live. But if there's a big issue, post it. And uh, one of our technical crew will let me know. And after the fact, I'm going to take the best questions and write up a big Q&A post about panoramic photography to give you some ideas on how to use all these things and put it together. So. Once again, welcome. My name is Rich Harrington, the publisher of photofocus.com, and today we are exploring panoramic photography. Well, I absolutely love panoramic photography. I have been a landscape shooter for a long time. I enjoy getting out there and just seeing nature, but panoramic photography could be a really wide view or a really tall view. And we've seen the popularity of panoramic photography rise largely because of things like phones having the feature built in. But if you want the best quality of panoramic photography, I'm gonna suggest that you move beyond the phone or beyond the built-in auto mode with some of these cameras and instead step up to a panoramic photography shot from a tripod using multiple photos that get stitched together. Now, the stitching process is super easy. If you've got Photoshop or Lightroom, the new version of Lightroom, this is built into Lightroom CC and it's been a part of Photoshop for years all the way back from Photoshop CS6, I believe, which is quite a long time ago. So if you've got this version of Photoshop, you'll be able to access this. So thank you guys for tuning in and why don't we jump in and start about the shooting process. So first up, if you are handheld shooting a panoramic photo, there's an important thing you wanna do. Instead of shooting the camera in sort of a widescreen mode or landscape mode, just turn the body, get it into portrait mode. This is going to make it a lot easier to get more images with less distortion. 
So as you turn your body and you're getting that shot, what it's gonna do is ensure that you have lots of photos. So quite simply is this, I'll just put it comfortably in my hands, tuck my elbows in and twist at the waist. And by turning small amounts, I can fire off those shots. And you just wanna turn so you have about 50% overlap. And ideally, you see there, I just captured a 180. That would allow you to get the photos that you need. Now, that's not the best method of shooting, but I want there to be no barriers. Even if all you own is a camera, simply tucking those elbows in so they're nice and tight and holding that camera there, it works well. You notice I'm sort of pushing down into my hand, creating a nice stable platform. And that makes it really easy as you rotate to minimize the distortion. So there's how you do it if you've got no gear whatsoever. But it's pretty easy to step up and improve this. Let's say you're shooting on just a normal tripod, nothing fancy, and uh, you don't have any of this other gear that I've already attached here to my unit. Well, one of the things that works in your favor is that most tripods will have small notches. If you look here on the unit itself, I'll just turn this so it's a little easier for you to see, your tripod head will usually have a little cutout notch there. And this allows you to take that and simply flop it over. So now your camera can be mounted. So if you were taking that camera and attaching it, you could attach the normal camera to your tripod and keep it in a mostly perpendicular mode. There we go. And at this case, that camera can rotate around. Now I would get it so that this was level more or less. That's pretty good there. And you see that that lets you rotate. But because the camera is not over the center of the tripod, this does introduce a bit of distortion and extra bit of problems when you go to post. So for example, if the camera's off to the side here, well, it's not on an important area that we typically refer to as the nodal point. This is where the lens and the image sort of cross and hit the sensor. Well, now we've moved it off the center here. So as that camera swings around, you see that the middle point of the camera is kind of moving in an arc as opposed to staying centered over the tripod here. So you see as that swings, well, that's fine, but it's not perfect, but it's better than handheld. You see with it there, you're gonna introduce a little bit of bowing. And if you were shooting something that was an interior, you're gonna notice it a lot more than if you're shooting a landscape. So this is kind of second best. And it's still a lot better than shooting this way. You see, if you try to shoot a panoramic photo with the camera in landscape mode, what happens is as you turn, you don't have as much resolution to work with. You get a very vertical photo and you don't have nearly as much as you did if you just turn the camera. So, well, how do we turn the camera and get it into portrait orientation while keeping it still over the center of the tripod? Well, this is where different equipment comes in. And so one of those things is what I have here. This is referred to as an L bracket. And you see that the L bracket makes it easy to attach right there to the tripod. So now we've got the same Arca Swiss style plate on the bottom and on the side. And I'm using some gear here from a company called Really Right Stuff, but it works just fine. So let me take this off. There are lots of manufacturers for this type of equipment. And if I rotate and open up my jaws here on my tripod head, you see that I could just turn the camera onto its side, set that right into the base plate there, use the center mark, ideally, what you're trying to do, there's a little mark here, if I turn to the back, you might be able to see it. And there's a small dot right there. It's a little hard to see, but I can line that up with the center of the tripod. And in doing so, I've now put the center of the camera right over the middle of the tripod. And that works pretty well. Now, what you might not realize is that on many cameras, there's a little mark here, this little circle with dot, and this little circle with the line going through it, that's the focal plane. So ideally, that should be right over the center of your tripod. If it is, now it's a piece of cake. And you see how simple this is that we can actually rotate. Now I'm using a dedicated panoramic head here and you'll see that it actually has degrees marks on it. This means that if I wanna be very precise with my rotation, 
as I turn that, it's super easy to consistently turn the camera the exact same amounts each time. Now, I want to show you something here on the computer really quick. And I just want to show you a sample of images shot this way. We're going to come back to the cameras in just a second. But in this case, here's a basic panoramic photo. And what we're doing here is stitching these together. So you could see that if we look at these, here's the one image. I turn the camera a few degrees. And with each turn, there's overlap. So take a look at this mountain peak here. You see it clearly in the frame. When I turn again, well, there's that same mountain peak. Here's the ridge. Turn again, there's that same ridge. What we're looking for is sufficient overlap. So with each of these panoramic photos, as you turn the camera a set number of degrees, you want to try to introduce some overlap between the frames. Now, these are just raw photos. I haven't done any processing to them yet, so they're a little bit dark, but I safely captured the highlights. And we'll talk about post-production more in a moment. Now, you see how the basics are here with the camera. I'm going to show you two more advanced options that you could step up to. Remember, though, if you have not posted a question in the Q&A pod, please do so, either on the web page or the page itself. One of our folks behind the scenes is going to be picking names randomly. We've got some great prizes today. We're going to be giving away a copy of Perfectly Clear, which is an awesome plugin for Photoshop and Lightroom so you can enhance your images. We're going to be giving away a three-month subscription to the Adobe Creative Cloud Photography Plan and a Platypod Pro, so three different winners. So make sure you post into those two areas, and we'll be drawing the names at the end of our webcast. All right, let me take this off. And one of the things I really like about Arca Swiss is that it's a standard, and that's just a style of play. It makes it easy to disconnect. I'm going to set this one down and grab the next camera here and bring it up. And again, instead of going in landscape mode, I could just turn that and line that up using the marks and tighten that in. All right. Now, in this case, I'm using a lens that's more of a portrait length a 55 millimeter lens, and that may seem strange to you, but with that overlap, as you turn the camera, maybe only 10 degrees each time, that's gonna make it really easy to capture an incredible amount of resolution. Think of it this way. This is the A7R2. I can capture images at about 42 megapixels. Multiply that by a panoramic photo, say a 180 degree panoramic photo with 10 degrees of rotation, and you're going to have about 18 source images going in. Sure, they're going to have a lot of overlap, but by the time you're done, you're easily going to be having an image that is incredibly high resolution, so much that you could print this out as an enormous print. And that's one of the reasons why I'll often use more of a portrait lens that has less distortion and captures a narrower field of view. Now, if you're really in the hurry and you're shooting, you can use a wider angle lens, that's fine. It'll take less shots to put it together. And if you're shooting a panoramic photo, say of a busy football stadium, well, that's gonna come in handy because you got so many people moving around. You're doing a landscape and it's pretty consistent lighting conditions with not a lot of movement or high winds blowing the clouds around. You could take your time and stitch together 18 photos for that landscape and use a higher resolution shot with a narrower focal length. So you punch in a little bit more but it's ultimately up to you. Now, if you want, as you start to attach these, sometimes folks are concerned that it's difficult to get the lens directly over the center. So I'm gonna remove this, I'll set this down, and let me just attach another piece of equipment up here. I'll take this unit, and this is just a small extender bar. So now, this makes it easy for me to move things. And if I look at this, it even has a bubble level on the end, which is pretty useful. I like to have that bubble level because it makes it easy for me to check, am I properly level? You see, if you shoot a panoramic photo and the platform isn't level, well, then you're gonna get bending or distortion. So now I could just put this plate on. There we go, slip that into place. Good. And tighten down. Make sure I'm on there. Just missed it. There we go. Snaps into place and I could put the camera into that new plate. Well, what this does is it makes it easier to adjust where this lens is sitting over the middle. So for example, I can move this forward just a little bit, and now where the lens is resolving on the sensor, 
right about there is going to work a little bit better for less distortion. Plus, on the back side here, I've got a bubble level. I'll tilt it so you can see that just a little bit more on your end, and then I'll go back to level. So if I just tilt this temporarily, you see there's a bubble level there, and that makes it very easy for me to get this level. Looks pretty good for now, but what I want to do is, with that level, swing this around and check it. Yep, still level, still level, and still level. The benefit of having that bubble level is you can make sure that as the camera rotates, things stay flat and that you're not getting a tilt or a cant to the panoramic photo. Works really well this way, and it just provides a little bit of extra stability. So you saw everything there from keeping it tight and small and turning at the waist to pull that off to mounting up there. But I want to show you one more thing that I really like, and we're going to be giving one of these away later. A big thank you to Platypod. Uh, this is a great product that's invented right here in America. And uh, small inventor, it's a pretty cool thing. And it comes with some screws and a great carrying case. And if I open this up, you'll see that it has a plate inside. And the plate has two threads. One of them is for a full-size ball head. So I could take that out. And what this allows me to do is easily attach my ball head. So there are times that I've gone panoramic shooting and I don't want to carry the full-size tripod. Or maybe I'm shooting off of the top of a big building. And I got to tell you, I've been chased off. Well, you could do this either way. You can mount them this way and have the rubber tip on the end, which makes it really easy for not scratching. Or turn it the other way and use the spike foot if you're going into soft ground. And so this makes it really simple. You just twist those on. There we go. And this is a pretty cool thing. It's 50 bucks for the plate and the kit. And then you get these stability screws here that you can put on. Just tighten those. The screws are actually made out of titanium. And this unit can be not just used on the ground, but bolted to surfaces as well if you need it. And it gives you a great stable platform. There we go. Let's just set that there on the ground. And I'll take this off of the tripod for a second. We'll remove the camera. Set that down. And let's just tighten this up. And we'll take the ball head off. And what I like is sometimes when I'm shooting, I don't have the ability to always bring the full-size tripod. So let's just twist that off. There we go. And you could take that and just put it right here on the unit. Line that up and twist. There we go. There it is. And you've got a great plate. So now if I need to use a rock as a shooting surface or a sign, and especially because you could adjust these to level this for an uneven surface. So you could even be shooting off of an incline or a log and you see you got a rock solid table surface there. So there's a simple conversion. And if I'm doing backpacking or traveling a small distance or traveling a long distance, sometimes it's nice to be able to just quickly switch that over, like you see there, and balance that out. There we go. And we've got a stable surface for shooting the tripod. So a nice alternative. All right. Let me go ahead and just break this down, and we're going to jump into some of the post-production now. But that gives you the idea on shooting. A couple more pieces of advice when it comes to shooting. Make sure that you are in either a manual mode or an aperture priority mode. You don't want the aperture changing as you get these shots. You want to keep things consistent throughout the shot so that you don't see any exposure changes or changes in the depth of field. Now, minor exposure changes are okay. Tools like Lightroom and Photoshop are super forgiving for blending those things together. So it's okay to shoot in aperture priority or even a pure manual mode as long as you're shooting raw. The critical thing though is do not let the aperture change and preferably don't let the focus change. Make sure you get out of the autofocus mode so it doesn't try to make adjustments in the middle of the shot. You want things consistent. So this may take a little bit of practice. Another two quick tricks. Things I like to do, sometimes I'll fire multiple shots of each of the brackets. That way, if someone was walking through or there was a minor imperfection, I have it. And last trick, so I know when a new panoramic series starts, it's really simple. I just put my hand in front of the frame and trigger it, 
And that makes it easy for me to know that that is a new break where things are just getting started. All right, well, there's some quick tips on shooting panoramic photography. If you're a photo focus reader and you wanna go deeper on the shooting side, I do have a full length course available on lynda.com all about the field shooting. And we go out and we do that over at Red Rocks in Las Vegas, Nevada. And you can get a free trial at lynda.com by going to photo focus uh, doc, uh, sorry, lynda.com slash photofocus. That's lynda.com slash photofocus. And you can check that out. All right, let's move on to exploring panoramic photography and talking about the post-production workflow. So I'm going to jump right into Lightroom. And uh, we're going to work with some of the photos here. Now I've already imported a bunch of different images. And what we're going to do is combine these. So let's do a real simple one here first. In this case, I have a vertical panoramic image, which is sometimes things that people forget to do. And what I did is I just shot this scene. It was this great little cove and I wanted to be able to see things. And so I shot the foreground with the rock. Then I panned up a little bit to get this little cove. This was just a small area. Then we tilt up a little bit more and then we start to get to the sunlight area where the skies were up above. All right. Easy enough, and when it merges together, we can see more of the whole image. So let's put these together. In Lightroom, if I select those four images, I can just shift click to do that. I can now choose photo, photo merge, panorama. And it's gonna analyze those images and attempt to put them together. Now, Lightroom offers three different modes for putting these together. Spherical, which tends to be more of a curve. Cylindrical, which is more of the inside of like a tube. So you'll see that it does a little bit less uh, wrapping at the edges there. Spherical curves a little bit more, while cylindrical is a little flatter at the edges. And then perspective, which is more for plates. And this type of image doesn't work with perspective, so it's not gonna pull it together. But that's pretty good. And when I'm ready, I could just click merge to generate the file. Now you could track its progress. It'll show up here above. You can see the creating panorama there and we'll give it just a second to complete the merge. What it's doing is taking the raw files, in this case, some images shot on an Olympus and it's gonna merge them together into a new raw file using the DNG format. There we go, should be done. And it adds it into my library. There we go, there's the DNG. And so here we go. And now I can take advantage of everything in my develop module. So you'll see that it behaves just like a normal raw file. So if you wanna come up here and drag on the histogram to recover your highlights a little and lift your midtones, you can do that. You want to go ahead and re-white balance the shot? Go ahead. And I can take advantage of options here and do some basic things like recovering the highlights a little bit so they're not so overexposed and maybe just gently lift the shadows a little. And this is looking pretty good, but I want to hand it off and let Perfectly Clear take a stab at it. So this makes it pretty simple. If you want to hand off to a plugin, you could just choose Photo edit in, and in this case, I'm gonna edit this in perfectly clear Lightroom. Now, perfectly clear is a third-party plugin that works both with Photoshop and Lightroom. They're one of our sponsors today, and I'm super glad. I use this all the time on my landscape work. It has some great presets as well as detail recovery that a lot of times gets a little bit muddy and lost. Let me show you how it works. So in Lightroom, I'm just gonna edit a copy with the Lightroom adjustments and hand off a new TIFF file with 16 bits. Now you can choose any color space you want. It prefers sRGB, but it'll work with Profoto and Adobe RGB. And I click edit and it's gonna take that file and hand it off. You see it made a new TIFF and now it opens it up. And so here's the before and after and you see that just the simple details recovery did a nice job but there's a great preset called landscape, which really pops the color. And I love how the purple and the turquoises are coming back through. And the contrast just looks so much better. 
Now, Perfectly Clear has a complete tab here that you can use to bring out the color more if you want. So sometimes I like really rich, vibrant images for my landscapes. And I can adjust the exposure. I love the high definition depth. And you'll also find the ability here for sharpening and noise reduction, which can be helpful. In this case, there was some pretty low noise in the shadowy areas of the image. And lastly, I like the light diffusion option here. So if you look at the before and after, let's punch in there for a second. And if you look at those rock details, you could see that it's really brought out the texture in that great surface of the rock and the color, which I love. So simple enough, press the return key and it's gonna apply that there. And it will simply send it back to Lightroom as the modified file. So now you've got that great workflow. You see that you've got your original raw files, you've got the new intermediate raw file if you need it, and you've got the enhanced TIFF file right there that you can use. So there's all of our different choices and it's loaded them in. So pretty simple, makes it easy to combine those. There's the edited enhanced TIFF and there's the raw file. So you can see the two, sorry, there's my TIFF and there's my DNG. And you can see, it takes a second to load, that the TIFF file definitely has a little bit more pop to it. And I love what Perfectly Clear did. All right, let's go back into the library and develop another one. Now, that was a vertical panorama. That was a vertical panorama file. And that's great. A lot of people only think of horizontal panoramic files. But what I'm going to do now is a traditional shot of it. Now, I'm going to take something that's a pretty big field of view. And we're going to do the basics inside of Lightroom. But I want to show you how you can also hand things off to Photoshop if you want to do some more advanced corrections. So we're going to take a look at a couple of times where you might jump from Lightroom into Photoshop. Let me show you. So here we go. Let's start by getting some images organized. In this case, I've got a couple of different images. And remember, if you're working with a panoramic file, feel free to select those. And then you can combine things with a stack, just Command G. And that makes it very simple as you're working in your library to keep things organized. So there's one stack, there's another, and this one's interesting. In this case, I actually have HDR images that are gonna be combined into a panoramic. So you can combine the best of both. If you wanna use Lightroom's HDR feature to merge bracketed images, you can do that first and then take those brackets and easily merge those into a new panel. So nobody said that you can only do one type of photography. And here's another set of images here, more of a traditional type panoramic photo. So I'll group those. So easy enough. And with that sort of style here, if you wanted to do an HDR first, you could take that and say, photo, photo merge, HDR, and that's going to give you an enhanced dynamic range. It'll take a second when it goes, but let it do the auto align and auto tone, and it's going to merge those into a new panoramic file, into a new HDR file, I should say. And the benefit here of the HDR file is that it just has enhanced dynamic range. So I'll go ahead and merge that. I'll do low deghosting for slight movement, because this was actually a floating bridge, believe it. And once that's done, we can click Merge. Now it's just applying the deghosting amount. It'll take a second. There we go. Merge. And now I could just select the next one, hold down the Control key, and invoke that. Photo Merge, HDR, and it will do the same thing. Now, if you want, you can actually force that to trigger it without the dialog. So if I hold down Control and Shift, it'll just reuse the last settings. So now Control Shift H, Control Shift H, Control Shift H for each one in the set. And what you're doing there is forcing the DNG files, the new HDR files to be created. You can see, in fact, if you look up here, that all nine are running at the same time. This is a great way if you need to quickly process HDR images to get that enhanced dynamic range. 
Then you could merge those HDRs into a panel, get it so the exposure looks okay, and then hand off to Perfectly Clear for those finishing touches to really bring out the clarity and the contrast and to restore some of the colors that get lost. One of the things I really love is how it handles blues and purples. You see, a digital sensor is linear, so it tends to have a shifting in the blues and purples as opposed to the logarithmic curve that was used by film, which makes it a little bit easier to keep blues and purples and those rich tones in there. All right, let's come on to another example here in Lightroom. I'll let those finish, and uh, we're just gonna do a very simple merge here. So let's take a series of photos. I'll come to this one here. And what I always recommend is take advantage of the geometric corrections. So if your lens offers lens correction, use it. Now you'll find that down under the right-hand side, you'll find the ability to work with lens corrections and you can easily do those fixes or you could take advantage of any of the other basic settings. So let's just scroll down here to lens correction and I'll enable the profile correction. And you could also take advantage under color of any chromatic aberration if it has it. Now this particular lens, since it was shot micro four thirds, the lens correction profile should have been automatically applied. And that's pretty typical. If we take a look at the profile here, you'll see that it should indicate that there was a profile. Or if you can't find it, then it can't find it. But make any of those changes or use the manual changes if you want. And then up above, only make minimal changes to exposure. If you decide you wanna lift the shadows a little bit, that's fine, and do a base recovery on highlights. But beyond that, it's pretty good. Stay away from the color controls or anything else, and we can get those after the merge. Now, I'll simply select all of these and click the sync button so the same settings are applied across the board. So that works well. I'll just click synchronize and now they take on the same look. Now we're ready to hand that off. So I'll choose photo, photo merge, panorama, and it will invoke the panoramic merge. Now the images will load in and it will automatically pick a projection method if you click auto. In this case, it'll analyze the images and decide what makes the most sense. All right, while this is running, I'm gonna switch over to Photoshop for a moment and do a merge there because we've got Lightroom tasked pretty hard. One of the things that's nice is if you have Photoshop, you have the ability to do photo merges there too. Photoshop's pretty straightforward. You'll just choose File, Automate, Photo Merge. And this will give you the ability to load images. You'll also notice that Photo Merge in Photoshop contains additional methods. So you had Auto in Lightroom and you had Perspective, Cylindrical and Spherical, but Photoshop also offers Collage as well as Reposition. Reposition is useful if you did this type of panoramic photo where you just move the camera up and down and sideways or you repositioned your body side to side like a walking panorama. Maybe you were shooting a mural or a piece of graffiti and you simply took a shot, walked down a little bit, took another shot and kept walking and took another. Well, because the camera moved and didn't just pan, this is a reposition type. So Photoshop offers a few other methods which you might find handy. To add the images in, just click the browse button and you can now go and find the images. Now I've already put some up here on the desktop. Let me just go to my panoramic photo. There we go. And uh, there's my catalog, one second. Let me grab the images that I pulled. Pano files, there we go. And I'm just gonna put a simple one together. Let's do this. And we'll grab these and click open. Now these are all Nikon files and I'm gonna tell it to also fix the geometry of those files. That's gonna work pretty well. And additionally, if you wanted, you could apply some changes first. So you'll notice that Photoshop doesn't give you the ability to tweak these pictures in advance. So in this case, Instead of invoking this right away, let's click cancel 
and we'll choose File, Browse and Bridge. This will launch the companion program, Adobe Bridge. Oh, by the way, there's the Lightroom one. And uh, I got to admit, I'm pretty happy with that. So let's go ahead and merge that one while it's ready to go. And uh, then we'll switch back to Photoshop. So that merge is running in the background. And now we'll switch back to Photoshop or Bridge. There we go. And we can process those images. So let's go and open up that one we were working with here. And Bridge gives you the ability to see your files visually, which can come in handy. Now it's just going to take a second to cache. And if I want to force that, you can actually tweak things a little bit. Sometimes if Bridge has a lot of files to process, it might be a little bit slow. So in that case, you could just go in and grab it and force it to work. So let's just grab this folder here and drop it on Bridge. And it should jump right to that. There we go. Oh, be that way. <laughs> One second. I love when I make a mistake. There they are. We'll just open them up the manual method. So with a right click, I can open these. And all we need to do is send them to a tool that can handle it. So I'll do Photoshop initially. And this is going to load it into a batch window. So now you can do any changes you want. This is where you could jump to that tab for the lens issues and enable the lens profile correction. You see there that it fixed the wrapping and the corner. That works well. In this case, it's a Nikon. It was able to read all that data in. Again, since we're going to be going to perfectly clear, don't really do much except for if you want a little bit of highlights and shadows, but perfectly clear it should be able to get those for me. So that looks pretty good to me. I'll just select all of my images here on the right, Command A, right click and choose Sync Settings and tell it to sync everything there. So I'll click OK and now they're all consistent. If I click Done, those settings are now stored in a sidecar file. So let's go back to merging that. Photo merge. Grab those files. There they are. And you see the sidecar files right next to them. Let's open those images. And we'll choose the geometric correction. And I'll click OK. Now, Photoshop goes to town and starts to load each of these images. And what it's doing is it's putting each one into a layered file. It's going to take a little bit of time, but it does a pretty good job here. And what it's doing is loading each one into the layered document. Once that's done, it looks for the overlap in the files and it will automatically align them. Now, this is slightly different than Lightroom. In Lightroom, you were making a DNG file, so it was staying raw. In Photoshop, it can do more processing to the files to make a match. It's going to tweak the exposure slightly to get a clean scene between the images. If it needs to do more geometric corrections, it can. So it's ultimately up to you. I find these days I do about 80% of my merging in Lightroom, but then I still hand off to Photoshop. Sometimes because Lightroom can't handle a really tough image and Photoshop seems a little more robust because it's had photo merge longer. Or other times it's just to take advantage of things like advanced wide angle correction or content aware fill or patch healing, which I'll show you in just a second. All right, let's see how that's doing. You'll see that it's aligning all of those files. So what it's doing there is it's shoving them to the left and the right and it's looking for overlap between the images. Now, this step is pretty straightforward. And what it's doing there is going to look for details that exist on both sides. Once it's successfully completed, it will then blend them. And this is going to automatically generate seamless masks for each edge. So let's let that finish. It'll take just a second. And uh, this is probably the slowest, most boring part of the panoramic developing process. But it's OK. It did a lot of work there. And you'll notice that it was able to match those together. So let's, for example, turn this layer off and zoom in. And you see that Photoshop intelligently applied a layer mask and went around key details and created a seamless blend. 
So in this case, we've got the whole file. Now, it's up to you. If you're happy with this, you could just merge these together and have a new image. So I'm just going to do that now. I'll choose Layer Merge or Command E. And it's looking pretty good. My only concerns here is that there's a little bit of distortion. Now, we were shooting on a hill, so this actually wasn't totally flat. There was a peak and a rise and a fall, but I want to fix that a little bit. So let's do that using a really cool filter. Now, before I start to apply those filters, I can do things like work with smart filters, or I can work direct here and speed it up. And we're going to do the adaptive wide angle filter. This makes it easy to fix a horizon. So I can click on the horizon and come over to here and notice how it recognized the horizon. There we go. And now with a simple shift click on that line, I've got a horizon, which was really pretty easy. Now, yellow means it's close. So if needed, you might drag that just a few degrees until you get green. And now that curve is gone. I've got a perfectly straight horizon. Now, you could scale in and punch in a little bit if you want, but a lot of these missing pixels are going to be pretty easy to fix using a tool like Content Aware. So let's just click OK and send that off, and it's going to apply it to the image. What I now want to do is fill in the missing pixels. Content Aware is a pretty straightforward command. It looks at the surrounding areas around an area and generates new pixels. You do not have this in Lightroom, but you have it in Photoshop. So all we need to do is load the empty areas and then expand them a bit and it will fill in the texture. Here's how. Now we've got these missing areas, so I'm just going to hold down the command or the control key and click on the thumbnail and you see it loads the selection. Now I'll choose select inverse and it's selected the empty areas. Now we'll expand that a little bit. Modify, expand, and I'll push that out about 40 pixels because this is a really high-res photo. Now, with that area selected, I could just choose Edit, Fill, and Invoke Content Aware. I recommend Color Adaptation, so it does a good job, and then just click OK. It's going to look at those surrounding pixels and attempt to create new pixels to fill them. Now, if it's not perfect, you can use the clone tool or the patch healing tool, but usually this does a pretty good job. We'll give that a second to catch up. It's pretty intensive here. Keep in mind that this is an extremely large file, and uh, it's going to generate new pixels to fill that in. Any second now. <laughs> the joys of life. There we go. And let's zoom in to see that. Well, I got to say, I'm pretty happy with that. Did a nice job of filling in that texture. And if we look at the lower left corner, that's really good. I can't tell where the information was. Let's undo real quick. There's the selection. So you can see where it filled in the new texture. So that's pretty amazing. All right, for just a quick reality check, this is a big image. If we were to print this at high quality print setting, it would be about a 55 inch print. In fact, a lot of times what people will do is print their panoramas more in the 200 or 240 range. And look at that, that's a 70 inch print, just taken off of a standard run of the mill base level Nikon camera. So that gives you a pretty powerful image to work with. All right, at this point, I really wanna bring out some of the details. So I'm gonna apply perfectly clear. Now, you can convert this to a smart filter if you want to work non-destructively, and that could be helpful, and it's just going to nest that layer inside of itself so that any filter you apply is editable in the future. Now, this is a pretty big file, so it may take a second to save, but that'll give us the ability to work non-destructively, and that's going to let us run perfectly clear. Now, let me let that finish, and I'm going to switch back over to Lightroom for just a second and take a look at that image that merged. There's that Lightroom file we got. There's the DNG file, not too bad. And in this case, I like it, but we've got that same curvature to the horizon line, and it kind of annoys me. Now, 
if you look at this, this is almost 270 degrees field of view. So I'm not surprised that there's a curve, but I can easily fix this. This is because we could say photo, edit in, and we could hand that off to Photoshop or better yet, open it as a smart object inside of Photoshop. And now it's gonna hand that file off to Adobe Photoshop and open it up. Now, let me go back to Photoshop here where we're working. It handed off that raw file, there it is. So let's work with both. Here's the one we were starting with. I'm gonna do the perfectly clear on this image. So filter, Athentech imaging, perfectly clear. And remember folks, we're gonna be giving away a copy of this as well as a copy of the Creative Cloud Photography Plan. So if you haven't posted a question, please do so. I'll be getting to those questions in just a little bit. I'll do a follow-up post after this hangout. And that's how we're gonna pick the winners. All right, well, right away, I love what that's doing. Look at the clouds pop. And one of the things that's nice about Perfectly Clear is that it will never clip your blacks or whites. So even as you start to boost the colors, you don't have to worry about the whites or blacks going away. And I just love how that's coming through. Now, you've got total control here under the Adjust tab so you can modify things. You want richer color, you could pop the vibrancy or back that off. If you want the fidelity to really pop or keep the colors a little more standard, in this case, I like that, slightly more subdued. I'm gonna use the high definition depth and where that really stands out is in the cloud area. Now, if we take a look here, the clouds are coming across nicely and I love how they're just popping. We go from sort of flat, dingy clouds to rich blacks and bright whites without any clipping. So that works well. I'm gonna lift the exposure just up slightly and that feels pretty good. And because we had a little noise, I'll apply it. And I love that they've got great things here for different types. A simple default value should work pretty well. And I'll press the return key to apply that. Now, Perfectly Clear is gonna to apply to that image and it's gonna create the new and enhanced image pretty quickly. And we'll let that finish out. Let's jump on in here for a second. Actually, it looks like it's done. So I'll just stay here for a moment. But you see that that was pretty fast. There's the before and the after. And I love particularly how the skies are looking. Just so much more interest there in the sky. And some of those flat areas of color that were getting lost are really coming back. So that works well. Now, here's that other object that we handed off from Lightroom. Remember, all I did over on the Lightroom side was with the new panel selected, chose photo, edit in, open a smart object in Photoshop. So now we're already in Photoshop and we're ready to go. So easy enough, filter, adaptive wide angle. And we'll just click on that horizon line there, click. Not bad. If it's not quite getting it, you can pull that in a little bit and do more than one. It's a little tough here because we do have the mountain range, but that's not bad. Let's click shift on that. Shift click on the line. That looks a lot better. And we can tweak that. Now, remember, you've got a couple of different methods here. So if you've got other problems like fisheye correction, you can try that. And that gives you a center point. So now it's easier to pull that center point up. And if it's too far, it might beep at you. But just take it a little bit. Not bad. Let's move that down a little. There we go. And that did a pretty good job of fixing the distortion. Remember, yellow means it's close, so just turn that slightly until it goes green, and you'll get the fixed perspective. Now, feel free to invoke Content Aware Fill if you need to, or any of the other changes that you want. In this case, I'm just gonna recrop the image and finish it out. So I'll press the C key for the crop tool and simply clear this out and adjust the crop. There we go. Not bad. And it's still a smart object, so I can invoke perfectly clear. Now, when you crop 
a object that's a smart object, sometimes the filters will take a moment to reprocess. This is by design. It's because it's got to reanalyze the content and feed out the best results. So don't be surprised if that happens. It takes just a second, but it does give you more flexibility for infinite levels of undo. All right, now we'll invoke that filter, Athentech imaging, perfectly clear. And let's just bring out the details. I'll go with a strong landscape, but bring up the exposure a bit. And I'm just gonna decrease the depth slightly. It's just a little too strong. There we go, I like that. Pop the vibrancy, looks pretty good. I'll go with a standard there and press return. And my details come back out much better. Now remember, after the crop, if you decide you want to, you can re-invoke a filter by just double clicking on it and that'll give you the flexibility to go in and make a small change if you need to. I can just clear that one out and let's just redo. So I'll click here and drag. There we go. That looks a little better. Scale that up slightly, press return and everything is going to propagate. Let's just rotate that so it's straight. There we go, looks good. And perfectly clear will update as well as the photo because everything was nested non-destructively. All right, we'll let that finish and then I'll do one more trick inside of Lightroom. It's almost done. And it updates the filter to bring out the color a little bit better. And there you have it. Now, when you close and save that, here's what's really awesome. It takes a second to write the file, but when you switch back to Lightroom, that file is gonna automatically be added into your Lightroom library. So there's Lightroom. And once that finishes closing, it's just gonna stick it at the end here and it'll be available as a PSD file. So that makes it really simple to do the handoff between the two programs. There it is. There's the Photoshop file. So if I need to, I can just reopen that in Photoshop or do any work. So there they are. There's the TIFF that was handed off versus the original DNG. So you've got all that information there, easy and ready to hand off. All right, let's do one more image really quick and we'll go back to our library for this. And uh, I'm just gonna pick one here that is pretty straightforward. Let's do this one here. a nice three shot image. And this one was actually shot before digital. So this was shot on film, a simple three pano shot, and I scanned them in. And I wanted to show you that digital tools can still affect older type images. So now with those scans, I could say photo merge panorama, and I'll let it choose the different methods here. And you'll see that actually perspective is a bit of a better method because it's a three image panel. Again, this was a film panoramic image of the Grand Canyon shot on regular film and scanned in. I'll now click merge and it's gonna merge those files together. Now, I didn't have raw fields to work with. So while Lightroom's really good at recovering stuff out of raw files, it's only so, so here for this but you'll notice that it's still made a DNG file because that's what it does when it merges. So we can go ahead and you know play with some of the recovery here and I could try to make these tweaks, but it's gonna become very clear that there's only so much you can do with a scanned in file that's not raw data. But this is where I love perfectly clear. So I'll just go ahead and hand that off and I'll edit it inside of perfectly clear. But in this case, instead of handing it off here, I'm going to open it as that smart object in Photoshop. Now, you could do it. The interface is exactly the same between the two programs, but the key difference is that when you hand off to Photoshop, if you have it, now filters can be tweaked non-destructively. So I'll invoke perfectly clear. And let's go with the landscape preset as a starting point. That's looking nice. Look at how it just brought out the colors there that were lost. I really like that. And I'm just gonna make a few small tweaks, bring the exposure down just a little. I like that. 
a little more vibrancy, a little sharpening. And I'm going to also do some depth bias here to favor parts of the photo. Now, that's looking pretty good. The only challenge that I have is I think the trees are a little bit further than I'd like. So it's looking pretty good. This is where playing with vibrancy and playing with depth is going to be the right balance. But that's feeling pretty good. When I hit return, what's nice is that you have a mask attached. So if I decide that I don't want to tweak these trees here, well, easy enough. Grab my paintbrush, adjust the size of the brush, and simply paint with black. And it will restore the original details there. So I can paint back some of the details and mix between the two states if needed. So you see there that I was able to modify the mask on that image just slightly. And remember, perfectly clear is very easy. If you decide you want to blend it, just double click the blending option there. Perfectly clear has this too. But you could simply back off between the before and after state for the filter, getting half of the filtered image mixed in with the original. And I like that. I'm really happy with the details that that was able to bring out. So, all right. Why don't we go ahead and hand out some prizes? Were you able to pick a couple of names? Uh, yes. Good. We'll have those names here on set in just a second. And I just want to do a quick wrap up and a thank you to our partners today who helped us put the webcast together. Now, normally I'm webcasting from my office or my home office, but today I'm in the Media Factory Studios in Washington, DC. So I hope you guys enjoyed the extra bells and whistles of camera angles and live feeds and all of that. If you missed part of this Hangout, it should be available immediately after. The Google YouTube video will refresh and you'll be able to watch that. And of course, feel free to share this with other folks so you can uh, help them catch up on their photography as well. My name's Rich Harrington. I'm the publisher of PhotoFocus. And today, we talked about a couple of different products that were useful, in my opinion, for making panoramic photography. First up was Perfectly Clear, which is a great plugin that does automated image correction and allows you to tweak the parameters, but it analyzes the image and does a great thing of restoring contrast and recovering shadows and highlights, as well as really bringing out colors in a very natural way. Another thing we talked about was using a different type of device. So if you can't shoot off of your tripod, you can actually transfer that tripod to a platypod, which worked out well. Go ahead and bring them on up. Thank you, Hillary. <laughs> Thank you. So the Platypod allows you to easily convert your full-size ball head. So when the tripod police say you can't bring the tripod, or you're going on that five-mile hike and you want to carry something light, this weighs 0.3 ounces. Yes, about a fifth of a pound. And it allows you to take your full-size ball head and simply attach it. Or if you're more of an iPhoneographer or any of those, it does have a smaller thread that'll work with mobile mounts, but that gives you the ability to then easily attach that. And I also showed you the workflow between Lightroom and Photoshop, which is part of the Creative Cloud Photography Plan. And of course, Perfectly Clear is available as a plugin for both, or as a bundle if you find yourself jumping between the programs like I do for panoramic photography. All right, so uh, our winner here of the Platypod is Wayne Roth. Three months of the Adobe Creative Cloud plan is Wes Sutton, and Perfectly Clear is going to Jose uh, Gavia, I believe, yeah. Garcia. So there you go. And uh, feel free to get in touch with me at rich at photofocus.com. Give me about a week or two to get those prizes out. I have to send your information on to the manufacturer. What I'm going to need is your Adobe ID if you're getting the Adobe prize, and then a mailing address and your email address so that they can get in touch with you and send you your prizes. All right, folks, I really appreciate you tuning in to this Hangout. My name's Rich Harrington. Remember, you can head on over to photofocus.com. There are thousands of articles, a writing team of 20 talented photographers sharing their ideas and inspiration with you. So if you're not a regular reader of the website, please head over to photofocus.com. Once again, my name's Rich Harrington. Thanks for tuning in.